So now I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Nancy Young, who's with us from Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Although Nancy has told me she's lived in five provinces in Canada and in New Zealand. Uh, Nancy's a consultant working with educators and families across Canada and globally, building awareness for the need and for, uh, supporting implementation of evidence-based reading instruction in schools. Nancy is a certified literacy, uh, structured literacy teacher, certified by the Center for Effective Reading Instruction, which is a partner organization of the International Dyslexia Association. She's also a member of the IDA and the Society for the Scientific Study of Reading. Nancy's areas of specialty include dyslexia, ADHD, giftedness, and English language learners. She's the author of Secret Code Actions, uh, which is a uh, both teacher and parent editions, which is a resource to provide ways to bring movement into code-based instruction. So Nancy will be talking tonight about the good, the bad, and the ugly, urgently informing school leadership of effective and non-effective reading instruction. So welcome, Nancy, and uh, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. Thank you, Jill. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, that sounds good. Great, I'm just going to pull the... Okay, so people can just drag that little box Pictures, with people's yeah, videos over. in it. I'm going to right share inside. All right. And Joanna and I will close our videos and then you can select an option in that box to um, uh, just have Nancy visible. Okay, take it away. Okay, thank you. So thank you everybody for uh, joining this webinar. And yes, I, I cut to the chase with the title, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly. We really need to uh, get the reading science into schools in Canada and in other locations. Before I go to much further, I just want to extend some thanks. Thanks to IDA Ontario for hosting this event and Jill Kearney especially. She's done so much work to, to organize it. Thank you. Thank you to the researchers whose work grounds everything I'm presenting. Thank you to Dean Stanton. Dean lives in Calgary, Alberta and Dean's art you will see throughout my presentation. Dean's art really represents my motto, which is that this can and should be fun. Thank you to my students and my parents. And I say my parents because for the last 15 years in my private practice, I have worked very closely with parents. Parents attend every lesson. And I've heard so many stories, heartbreaking stories. So when I present the faces of my students and parents and, and their stories, they just urge me on. And thank you to all the educators who are embracing the needed changes. Some are taking smaller steps, some are taking giant leaps. I just laud you wherever you are in the journey. So I hope that we have a number of people in positions of leadership who can get this going. Uh, we have a lot of teachers who want to make changes. We have a lot of parents who know the changes are needed. And to me, one of the biggest barriers is the fact that leadership is not on board. And I'm talking about leadership at all levels, in schools, in districts, and really provincially. So my background, I am a teacher and I've taught in a variety of capacities, both uh, in the classroom and outside the classroom, working with just about every exceptionality you could imagine. I'm now focusing on consulting, trying to reach more students in working with schools and, and teachers, but I still have a private practice and I still work closely with families on a consulting basis, trying to support them as they approach schools. I'm a parent and this grounds everything that I present. I know what it felt like to be a parent of two children with exceptionalities whose, whose needs were not meant, sorry, not met in the system. That's what I meant. Anyhow, it, uh, it was hard. I had to become very, very informed as a parent. And I really laud all those parents in this movement who have become so, so informed. And my parents, when I was in private practice and still in my teaching, my parents know more than most teachers. I'm an author, Jill explained, I'm an author of a book called Secret Code Actions, and I'm a learner. Very, very important. Nobody knows 
everything. We're all continually learning. And whether you are just starting on the journey or whether you are further along and this is reinforcing what you're doing or whether you're an expert, all of us are learning. So I, I embrace you wherever you are in the learning journey. Well, this is what I said I would address and it's going to be brief. It needs to be a snapshot. I hope for those of you who are just starting the journey, it will be a spark that will get you going. I could spend a few hours on every single one of these components. My examples are going to be Canadian. Uh, it's actually really exciting to say that because so, for so much of my career, I've used materials from outside of Canada and a lot of the research is still done outside of Canada. But we do have uh, Canadian, ex Canadian examples tonight and we do have some, some great Canadian researchers moving things along. Uh, the, the examples will be primarily English but know that what I'm saying would apply to other languages. So I know some of you leaders will be in schools where you're in French immersion or French only or Spanish. In Canada, we have so many different options for our children. What I'm presenting today applies to most languages. I, I won't say all because Chinese is a little bit different, but alphabetic for sure. I have a resource list on my website for anybody wanting to know the sources uh, that I am, uh, oops, sorry, presenting. Let me just go back here. All right, so starting out with the good. And again, I laud you for all you are doing well. We have so many teachers who are working so hard in schools and so many leaders working so hard and so many parents working so hard. Everybody agrees that learning to read is important. Huge efforts are being made to get books into schools where there aren't enough books. And, and parents are raising money and schools are raising money. Yay, books are important. Teachers, as I said, are devoting huge amounts of time and effort to instruction and, and assessment. Schools are analyzing data. I'm here of superintendents who are saying, send me the data. I want to know what the data is. Thank you for recognizing that data is important. And some, some students are receiving appropriate intervention. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I don't know. Okay, let's try again. All right, the bad. Well, learning to read is valued, but the learning process is misunderstood. We are making great efforts to get books into schools, but the materials are not always aligned to the instruction that should be and needs to be given, or even when the instruction is being given, the reading of text does not align to that instruction. Classroom teaching is not based on the science, and I'm going to address, be addressing that. Schools are analyzing data, districts are analyzing data, but the data they're analyzing is not based on good assessments. And the intervention is not happening soon enough, and it's not reaching everybody. We need to have interventions based on the reading start science, and we need to be starting early. And this is the ugly and truly, it brings tears to my eyes. We have so many suffering children. And this isn't just about classroom. This isn't just about academics. This isn't just about getting a job. This is about the emotions. We have so much anxiety because so many children are stressed out because they can't do what they think they should be able to do. They think it's their fault. We have children being labeled as behavior problems and their reading hasn't been tested properly. And we know the research has said that children can start acting out and trying to cope in various ways the first few months of kindergarten if they're not given the right instruction. Again, they think it's their fault. The suicide risk, heartbreaking, dropping out of school early, Homelessness, every, every time I drive by somebody who's, who's on the street with a card, I, I think, can they read? And incarceration, our jails are, are full of, of individuals who can't read and who haven't been given the opportunity to learn to read. So we have suffering children, suffering adults, suffering families, and suffering teachers, and this must stop. So, how did this happen? Well, the science has been around for many decades. And since, since the 1990s, 
we've had fMRIs that have shown the evidence as to what is happening in the brain. But there's a disconnect between the science of reading and edu educational practice. And Mark Seidenberg, I've got his book here. You'll see on the Queen of Post-it Notes, I've read it numerous times. He says, the gulf has been harmful. We need to make changes. And I'm holding those at the top levels of our government. And in Canada, it's the provincial governments who are responsible for developing the curriculums. And that means the guidelines for those who don't live in Canada. Our provincial curriculums are the guidelines that are supposed to tell teachers what must be taught and to give them support in, in teaching that, those specifics. And our provincial guidelines are vague. They contain inaccuracies and they're misleading, and they need to be changed. And I cannot at present recommend one provincial guideline or a provincial curriculum in Canada that I would recommend. So what happens is at universities, they do not teach the reading science. And when I've gone to them and asked them in numerous provinces, they've said, well, we're just using the provincial curriculums. The provincial curriculums are so vague that our university instructors can get away with not teaching the science. So what happens? Teachers think they're trained. I certainly thought I was trained when I did my B.Ed. I know nothing about teaching reading. And, and teachers go to the schools. And in the schools, they tend to model from the experienced teachers because most new teachers will not arrive at a school and do their own thing. So even if they know about their re the reading science, they're very cautious about, about uh, implementing that. But most teachers don't know about the reading science and they just follow what's happening in the schools. And what's happening in many, many schools is not supported by the science. So what happens, and the provincial governments have told me this, they said, well, we've asked teachers, we want teachers to be on board and making the decisions. We've had well-trained teachers advising us on our curriculums. And I've said, how do you know they're well-trained? Well, they are well-trained, they've gone to university. And so you can see why I call this a circle of dysfunction. This has got to stop. And I really do hold those at the top accountable for making the change happen. And I want one province to lead the way and everybody is going to follow eventually. So it's really important to understand that, that part of, of why this exists is, is the people at the top are sticking to this myth that reading is natural, that reading is easy, and that if parents would just read more to their children, that children would come to school and be ready to read. We are not born to read. The science has made that clear. We are born to speak, we are born to hear, we are born to move. We are not born to read. Every human has to have their brain re rewired. Actually, I should be pointing to the side, but now I'm thinking of the reversals and I won't do it. But anyhow, we need to rewire our brain. And this little child who's, who's reading may or may not be actually reading. That child may be pretending to read because that child desperately wants to do what that child thinks they're at school to do and everybody has been waiting for the child to do at school. This parent may or may not have, had, have struggled to learn to read. If this parent struggled to learn to read, the children are at genetic risk. We know that dyslexia is very heritable. And we also know the research has shown that for, for parents who struggle to read and, and some of them dropped out, school is not a happy place. So when, when teachers say, oh, the parents don't show up, they don't seem interested, it's really important to understand that, that walking through the school door is something they hope they would never have to do again. This little baby, we don't know whether this baby's going to struggle. We need to remember that every child's brain needs to be rewired to be able to read. So this baby will have to rewire its brain and that may or may not be difficult. So this is the ladder of reading. I'm going to pull my picture over. There we go, we'll see. I don't know if that works at your end. I carefully aligned everything, but everybody's picture is going to show up in a different spot. So just move me around. So this is the ladder of reading, and this is 
something I created in 2012 to help parents and teachers better understand the wide range of ease in learning to read. This has nothing to do with intellect. It has everything to do with, with whether or not um, a child has the brain circuitry, which is going to make it more difficult, and also whether or not, yes, environment does matter. Sometimes it's, it's more difficult when, when, the, um, when the environment is not conducive. So those children who haven't been exposed to, to books and, and to an environment where they're read aloud to. This has nothing to do with IQ. So we know that for some children, it's more difficult. Look at the few number of children for whom it's effortless. Very, very small number of children for whom it's effortless. And look at the number of children who need support in the red and the orange. These children are dependent on instruction at school. Instruction really does matter. We know that we can't control what's happening at home. We know that we have the ability to make a difference by what we're doing at school. And Dean's art here of the children's here, I wanted Dean to show the children smiling because it's so important that we try to make the journey as enjoyable as possible. We all know as adults, when something's difficult, we don't want to do it. So we need to try and bring joy to the journey. And I believe that's really possible. I just want to also say that in Canada, the word dyslexia, the term dyslexia is not used much. We tend to use LD. I'm saying that we should say dyslexia. And uh, the, the recent DSM clearly stated that dyslexia is an alternative term. And basically, in a nutshell, dyslexia is severe difficulty learning to read. It's a language processing issue, not a vision issue. We know that we ha have children who are advanced readers who are going to be IQ. And part of my message today is better reach the needs of all children. We also know that children who have dyslexia may have above average above average IQ. They will not all be above average, but some are. And for those children, it's very difficult. We know that this, this arrow in the middle, we know that, that children who are from low SES backgrounds and, and, uh, and ELL backgrounds, it's very difficult for them to show their gifts and talents if they are above average IQ. We need to do a better job teaching reading so everybody can better show their strengths in school. And this is, this is a really, really sad slide. Uh, and this is what, what drives me on as well, the, the, the risk that, that so many struggle, struggling readers have in terms of the risk of, of dropping out and of emotional uh, duress and suicide. And again, I've said it's hard to find children, uh, see their talents and gifts if, if they can't do what they're being asked to do at school. So we must be aware that many children are vulnerable and and in a nutshell, if you don't enjoy school, you're not going to be happy. So we need to do a better job. So this is my primer, and it's on my website and in your slides. I am not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to know that if you are a leader, you need to know this information. I can understand that parents might not know this, although the parents with whom I work do. I can understand that teachers might know this because our training is so poor. We need our leaders to know this. There really isn't an excuse. The science has been there. In order to understand what is needed, I am asking all leaders to learn what is on this page. So I'm going to quickly go through very briefly just to, to uh, give you a synopsis of these areas and and I hope you will go back and learn more and investigate more So phonology is the sounds of science. It has to do with listening wherever you are hold your hand to your ears if you're holding up a phone, you are listening to somebody talk on the phone and you are going to talk into the phone this is when we are listening to whole words to syllables in words and then to what is 
called the phonemes, the individual units of speech within words. So the word cat can be broken into k, a, t. Those are three phonemes in the word cat. Graphemes. Think of orthodontist, correct teeth. Orthography is correct writing. And a grapheme is a symbol. Again, get out your hand. I'm not sure what direction you're seeing this in, but just move your hand as if you're writing. Graphemes have to do with the written symbols. And so on the left, we see the phonemes. This is how we symbolize phonemes. We've got n, a, k. And the graphemes that symbolize those phonemes are symbolized here. And you see I've got it color-coded, so we have K-N-O-C-K. Those are graphemes, three graphemes in the word knock. And the system by which we teach this connection, the connection between the sounds and the symbols, is called phonics. We need to be teaching phonics. Phonics is not a bad word. It's simply a system by which we teach children the secrets of the code. And I say that, that many adults are not teaching and don't know the secrets of the code. And that is what one of the obstacles is. The children love to learn the secrets of the code. What child does not want to be a word detective? But when teachers don't know the secrets, it's very hard to teach them. This is a simple view of reading. And the simple view of reading simply tells us that decoding times language comprehension equals reading comprehension. Reading comprehension is a product of decoding times language comprehension. Now, we know that language comprehension is important, absolutely. But many schools are not addressing the decoding. And many children are not able to decode. And that's why sometimes you'll see a zero here. And if they can't decode, they're not going to comprehend. It's as simple as that. So underneath the puzzle system, we have morphology, syntax, and semantics. Morphology has to do with units of meaning. So we can say reaching. So we have reach, ing, reaching, reach as, reaches, reached. Notice that the ed was represented by t, reached. The units of meaning are so important to learn. As we teach the code, we gradually bring in the instruction about the units of meaning aligned to where, where they fit in well with systematic teaching of phonics. We need to be giving children this experience. This is part of what they need. And you can imagine how much they need it for, for all the reading going th forward throughout the grades. Syntax, we're talking about the speech part, the function. Is it a noun? Is it a verb? What role does it play in a sentence? And semantics, what's the meaning? So reach, to reach, that's a verb. I have a long reach because I've got long arms. And in New Brunswick, there is a place called long reach. A reach on a river is the long part of the river between two bends. And that is why long reach got its name. Look at the background knowledge we can be building all the time. And we can be building this all the time, starting kindergarten up and starting in preschool, building background knowledge as we talk about the meanings of words. And some of our smallest words have the most meanings and children love to learn about the meanings of the words. So some of you may be saying, well, we thought we were doing what is needed. Well, in Canada, we've had a huge emphasis on what was called balanced literacy. And I hate to break it to you, but it, in many cases, it's actually unbalanced. And I'm going to show you some charts. I wish I had more time to show you more charts, but I've chosen just a few. So in Canada, many, many schools are using a leveled system of assigning books. People don't realize, the teachers don't even realize, the principals don't realize. This is not based on complexity of those orthographic patterns. Remember, graphemes, orthography, correct writing. They're based on the number of words and sentences per page. And the text is written so it's predictable and it's repetitive. 
And I'll show you an example. And then children are being given these words to go home and memorize. And the children in the orange and the red go home and they're in tears because they can't memorize them. And then everybody's in fights and all of the stories I've heard, it's, it's so sad. We need to have text that aligns to the sequence, especially for to those who are at the beginning. We need to have a variety of texts. We need to have single words, phrases, sentences, and our stories don't all need to be illustrated. We need to be teaching those words that don't fit the, the patterns in a very systematic way. So the read aloud process. Well, what's happened is the, the text that I just showed you, those level texts have actually led to this because the children haven't been taught the code in the word. And so they are being taught to guess. They are being taught to guess based on looking at the picture, to guess based on the first letter, to skip and go to the end of the sentence and to substitute a word. Oh, that is so wrong. And in most schools and, and in so many professional development days, the focus is comprehension. So much focus on comprehension and the children can actually decode what they're trying to read. We need to focus on teaching children to decode. And we know that as they do that, we can be building in expression. We need to be supporting. If they're using other texts, we need to be supporting it in ways that are going to build their skills, not hold them back, which is what this does on the left. And we're always talking about word meanings. This is not abandoning meaning. Word meaning at every stage of the process. We interweave every component on the structured literacy page that I showed you. So this is a book that I wrote because I'm very respectful of copyright. And so I wrote a book that would be similar to a leveled reader in school. And I call it the book that I hate because this book is based on guessing. And you can see here that Forrest, that actually the title is full of complex graphemes. And the book is usually read aloud by the teacher. And then the children, the children are listening. Those children, the orange and the green, they are hanging on to every word, trying to memorize it. So when it's their turn to read, they will have memorized what it is. And the children with working memory difficulties, they are really frustrated because they can't remember. But look at these patterns. The, the repeated words forests have, and then on each page it changes, trees, leaves. But look, there's a picture. For each new word with a complex pattern, there's a picture. And the teachers have been taught, if they've been taught to teach reading at all, they've been taught to teach children to look at the pictures and to guess. And the teachers don't know that this is holding children back. These are the strategies that are being sent home to parents, and this is what children have been given in school. And I've shown these to students, and they've said, yes, this is what I was given. A, a, a boy on Vancouver Island with severe dyslexia, this is what he was given. A, boy, a, a girl with whom I'm working, she was told, skip, go to the end of the sentence. Look at this one, look at the pictures. Look at this one, look at the pictures. I kid you not, when I talk to skilled readers, they say, oh, come on, they aren't looking at the picture. This is what is being sent home. This is what is being practiced in schools. And our struggling readers are being held back. Learning words by shape, I know some of you will find it hard to believe, but this is actually happening. Teachers are being told to teach words by shape, and I'll show you the evidence. So those guessing strategies are coming from a, an approach called three queuing. And there's so much research saying this is a seriously flawed conception of the processes that are involved in skilled reading. Skilled readers don't guess. And here from Kilpatrick, skilled word reading does not require context. Remember, I said we don't need these pictures. It's not as efficient as phonic decoding. And we're asking our, our struggling readers to learn something that skilled readers don't do. And I've seen videos put on, sponsored by governments across Canada, where experts are standing up in front of a room full of teachers teaching them how to teach guessing. So sad. So this is Ontario. And you can see here, down at the bottom, teachers are being told to use visuals. Up here, predictable word order. And my, my pictures are covered, but under here it says word shape. Word shape. Remember that picture I showed you? 
Saskatchewan, look at the pictures. And in Saskatchewan's information, their curriculum guidelines for teachers, uh, in their 50-page document, the word decoding was mentioned twice. And it came after this advice to teachers to use pictures and illustrations. Let's go to British Columbia, grade one, two, three. Look at this, three queuing systems. Remember I told you it's based on a flawed conception of the reading process. And here the BC government has told teachers to use three queuing. And if you look really closely, let's see if I can find it. Oh yes, there it is, phonics. It's buried. There's no information for teachers on how to teach phonics. There's no uh, appendix like in the Common Core in the States. The Common Core has an example of a sequence. Teachers don't have it. And I only had time to bring in three, but this is, this is very characteristic of our curriculums across Canada. And the BC government, this is a brand new curriculum. Tragic. This is what we need when it comes to teaching phonics. We need to teach explicitly. This is one example. This is the one I use. A good sequence will be very, very similar no matter what program or approach you're using. So here we teach A represented by A and T represented by T and a child can read the word at. And then we add in P represented by P and then they could read pat and tap. And just so you know, the words in red are those frequent words on the dolt and fry list. We don't need to be memorizing them by whole. We need to be giving our children the opportunity to learn to read, and this is how we do it. Systematic instruction of the code, and they build and build and build and build. And by lesson 36 in the, in the sequence that I use, the children can read over 700 close syllable words. Oh my goodness. So amazing. So when it comes to text, we want our text to be supportive of what our children are learning. So for example, here, lesson 8b, we will have taught the suffix s spelled s. And, and look at the story that has that suffix. Now, we haven't taught suffix s um, sound as z yet, we are doing it one at a time. And look at what they can read. And, and our advanced readers don't have to read this, but they might want to. But our children in the brown or the orange and the red, they need this and they are building, 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 and they love it. It's so amazingly uh, rewarding to be able to read. They want to be able to read. So quickly touching on screening and progress monitoring. I have to take a deep breath about this because it's so tragic that we are assessing, 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 and the children are sitting there and being asked questions, and a lot of the assessments are not grounded in the reading science. We're wasting our time in many schools. We're wasting our money in many schools. The schools are, are not using the assessments that give the information that they need. And because the assessments are tied to three queuing, and they're tied to leveled readers. And I've already said to you, they aren't supported by the science. So we are doing things like measuring comprehension in kindergarten. Uh-uh. We are, are following a wait to fail approach that is, is waiting until kindergarten, or sorry, until grade three before addressing it. And the reason I say we can be testing, just going back to comprehension in kindergarten, we can be asking them for, for feedback about a story that we have read aloud. But if a child can't read something, you're not expecting to judge them, to mark them, to assess them on whether they can understand it. Because remember the simple view of reading, if they can't read it, they won't be able to comprehend it. So what is needed is good assessments, good screeners. We might need to, to assess more deeply for some children. That's okay. We need to be set, assessing their phonological skills and going more deeply into phonemic awareness to the point where we are assessing their ability to manipulate phonemes, and you'll have to um, look at that in the information. We're testing decoding and encoding. We are assessing their writing, including their spelling. Reading and spelling need to be taught like this. 
And if we are worried about spoken language skills, there are assessments that measure that. We need to be very, very careful in what we're assessing and how we are addressing it. So here is the ladder of reading again. And here we are, I want to focus on why I keep saying to people that this is also advantageous. Okay. The ladder of reading has made it clear that for children in the red group, they need a lot of instruction. It needs to be very explicit, systematic, sequential diagnostic. Okay, we are going to have to break things down for the group in, in the um, red group. The orange group are going to need some of what the red group need, maybe not quite as much. But let's look at the light green and the dark green. And in here, I want you to think about those children who are English language learners, who need some of the code, but might leap up the ladder of reading very quickly. What about the children who are coming to school who haven't had the book exposure, but we want them to be enriched. We want to be always enriching them with text. We're always doing that. So let's look at, at at how the green could be advantageous in phonology. Why would we not teach all of the children in the class about the phonemes in the language of instruction? In English, if we're teaching English, a number of our phonemes do not exist in other languages. Teachers need to know that. I believe, and I don't know the research to show it yet, I'm hoping soon, I believe that it's very advantageous in terms of cultural awareness for our advanced readers to be able to learn about phonology in order to better understand cultures. All of our curriculums are asking teachers to build cultural awareness. We can do it by comparing the phonemes in different languages to build an understanding as to why some people have trouble articulating English words. Let's look at orthography, the written symbols. When we're teaching about those written symbols, we can be teaching the history of the language. So in English, we can be teaching about the Anglo-Saxon background to the English language, the words that are based in Latin, the words that are based in Greek, so many exciting things that are so enriching. So those children who are above average, who come to school and they already know how to read, and that was my two children, they could read before kindergarten. I believe that they, they would have been so enriched by all the things that I'm advocating and they didn't learn about it. Let's go to morphology, the units of meaning. We know that science and social studies and math are all full of, of words with many morphemes. If we're teaching chemistry, we are teaching words with many morphemes. My daughter said to me not long ago, she said, mom, if I'd learned more about my morphology, it would have been helpful in medical school. So my daughter became a doctor, I'm so proud of her, but I, I know that she missed so much of what could have been advantageous and made their, their learning enriching. And they didn't have the advantage, advantageous uh, aspect could be applied to children in gifted programs, remembering that some children in gifted programs may also have dyslexia. So I draw your attention to the arrow here, which is saying that we need to bring in all the amazing things about structured literacy that can, that can make it intellectually engaging. And those children who are, who have ADHD, ADHD, they will be more focused because it's interesting. The children with whom I've worked, they eat this up and the parents are always saying, why wasn't I taught this? It is so fascinating and our teachers are missing out on this knowledge because they haven't been trained in it and our children are missing out and it's just really sad. It's really important also to understand that this can be delivered in a really fun way. I've mentioned it before, it's important to know this is supported by the research. Elementary teachers, kindergarten teachers, they want their children to have fun. And there's a myth that 
teaching the components of structured literacy, that teaching about phonics is not fun. Well, I have a blast when I'm teaching. It is so much fun. We need to show teachers this. First steps, I promise some first steps. Well, the first thing you've got to do if you're a leader, wherever you are on, on the, the different, uh, I won't say levels, um, plateaus, I'm not sure. Whether you're in a school, whether you're in a government, whether you are a reading specialist, you've got to look closely at how you are teaching reading and remembering skilled readers don't guess. I ask you to look closely at your program, or if you're in the provincial government, look closely at your provincial curriculum. And then start to take steps. For those of you in a school, you may take small steps. My experience is that most Canadian educators are not ready, do not really want to embrace a box program. We know that you don't have to have a box program. Teacher education is the key. Those in leadership need to make sure that those in the system and those at universities are provided with education based on the reading science. We need to make sure that schools have the instructional essentials. We need to be teaching phonemic awareness. Not long ago, I ran into a kindergarten teacher in Ontario who was thrilled to be starting her own private kindergarten. And I said to her, oh, wow, that's so exciting. You can really focus on phonemic awareness. And she turned to me and said, what's phonemic awareness? She didn't know. She was raving about her instruction in ECE, early childhood education, and she didn't know what phonemic awareness was. Let's look at phonics instruction. The most fundamental thing is to have a sequence. The school needs to be using the same sequence across all grades. And once teachers start doing this, they love it. Teachers have said to me, I, I didn't believe that, that I could get into teaching a sequence and now I can't imagine not teaching a sequence. The read aloud text for those at the foundational stages needs to be aligned to the sequence. And because you will be using good assessments, you will know who needs that controlled text. And you can have all sorts of ways to enrich with that controlled text. The teaching and morpho morphology, semantics, and syntax needs to be tied to the sequence as well. And we need to be teaching writing. I don't have time, but on my website, there is a, a, a link to uh, some amazing research being done in the States where children are doing sentence combining in kindergarten. I hope you'll have a look. So again, going back to the screening, we need to be screening for reading readiness, and then we screen as children gain more skills. And then we are monitoring progress based on what we are teaching. Small steps can lead to big leaps. I've seen it happen. Once teachers have the knowledge, they run. And I wrote a post about this, or a blog post, I should say. My son says, Mom, it's not a blog, it's a blog post. So I hope you'll go and read my blog post. So I'm going to now share with you the voices of some teachers that I have met and asked to contribute to this session, because this isn't just me sharing this information. It's really important for leaders to understand that we have teachers crying, begging for this information. I've given professional development and teachers have waited to speak to me individually afterwards. And they've, some of them have been in tears saying, my, my principal won't let me teach phonics. My principal won't let me do any of this. What do I do? That is so sad. The number of situations I've heard where leadership is blocking this is, is just tragic. So here are the voices. An elementary teacher. And I'm going to read, as you know, I don't read from my slides, but this time I will. As teachers, we do not ha have access to the information we need to help students before they fail. Teachers know that they're not teaching all kids to read but they have no idea how to change that, or even that they can change it. Secondary teacher. I've been a classroom teacher for 26 years, and the reading and writing skills of my secondary students have clearly deteriorated. 
I'm sorry if there are words I'm missing, but my picture is covering it. The concept of breaking down words into phoneme syllables or even prefix root suffix is utterly foreign to them. This deficiency leads to a great deal of remediation at the secondary level, which affects our ab ability to engage in more grade appropriate concepts. So remember I mentioned morphology, units of meaning? So this teacher is saying they don't know about this. And when he talks about remediation, in a lot of secondary schools, they don't even have any remediation. Secondary teacher again. Schools are often not using the most beneficial reading practice. Sadly, many teachers, myself included, were never trained to teach reading using methods known to be the most effective. Students reach high school without a solid foundation, and they're unable to make the required leap, leap to reading to learn. They struggle to succeed independently in school. These secondary teachers want to be teaching all the amazing things that we can teach our children, and the children aren't ready. This is an elementary teacher whose child struggled and who sought out the reading science. She says, and as an educator, it was beyond disheartening to watch my own child struggle and despise school especially not knowing how to help her overcome her reading difficulties. As a classroom teacher, now in grade five, it astounds me how many students come to my class with skill level in reading years behind grade level. I see students struggle. I know they can be successful with the right instruction, systematic and explicit. I've seen it happen with my own child. And the number of teachers with whom I've connected or have contacted me who are struggling to teach their own children. It's just so sad. So last Saturday morning, I got up at five o'clock. I was still on Ontario time. I'd gone down to present in Syracuse at the Reading League and in, in Ontario for Decoding Dyslexia Ontario. And I got up at five o'clock and opened my computer and I had a message from a teacher out of the blue. And this is what she wrote. She said, thank you again for giving me the gift of teaching literacy well. I feel so equipped to teach phonics in this mad sea where so many teachers are struggling with the lack of appropriate resources and knowledge. And I have the shivers. She sees that she's being given a gift. She described the situation as a mad sea. This is a teacher who was in one of the schools where I was consulting and has now moved to another school where they don't know the reading science. And she's so grateful. I was so delighted to see this. So wrapping it up, um, just quickly, I think I have time. It's really, really important to understand that this can be a fascinating, fun journey. And we need as adults to make sure that our children learn the amazing things about their language of instruction. And in English, there are so many what I call clues and alerts. And WR is one of them. And when I present, I often ask the teachers to tell me, or parents, whoever I'm presenting to, to tell me what, what they know that's special about this grapheme, WR, what's special about it, and most people don't know. And so I, I share with them that words beginning with WR are all twisting words. So think of it, your wrist twists. When you have something wrinkled, the fabric has twisted. When we write, we are twisting the pen or pencil with our hands. When we ha feel wrecked, when we feel really wrecked after getting back from a long trip, we feel like we look twisted. And a wren, a wren is a bird that twists through the air. It is so much fun to teach all these things to children. And I always get children up and acting them out. And the research supports getting children to act out the meanings. And this is movement. So we've briefly covered these particular areas. I know it was brief. I hope that for those of you just starting, it might have lit a little spark and, and encouraged you to go. I hope for those of you who are on the journey, it's affirm to you that you are on the right road. Just keep, keep learning. And I just want to say 
again, that this is about raising the bar. This is not a pendulum swinging. No, 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 no. This is about teaching everybody better. And that is the ladder of reading. We need to be teaching all children about their language. We teach children all these complexities in physics and chemistry and science. And then we don't have we're not teaching our children the complexities of their language. It is so amazing for children. Every child has the right to learn this. Every child has the right to be advantaged and to make continual progress. Even those children like mine who came to school already reading deserve to be given more information and to be challenged. We need to address it early. We know that we, we must stop this wait and fail. We need to be starting in kindergarten. We know that we need to give teachers this information about the structure of their language. And I put here that hard work and joy are not mutually exclusive. I started out with rigor, but rigor, if you look at the etymology, has to do with stiffness. And there's really nothing stiff about this. So hard work and joy. We want to challenge our students. Yes, they need to work hard. Our advanced students, our gifted students, they need to learn to fail. We need to be pushing them, but we need to push push them in ways that are supported by the research. We know what's needed, let's advantage all. And I'm calling on leaders, particularly those leaders at the government levels. The waves of change are rolling in. Just recently, look at this, October 3rd, 2009, the Ontario Human Rights Commission has launched a right to read inquiry. Change is happening. So I say, why don't you lead the change? Be a leader leading the change rather than following. So thank you very much. I, um, I appreciate your listening wherever you are. And uh, I, I hope you'll go to my website for information. Uh, email me if you have any questions. My website has lots of information. I'm on social media trying to promote this information whenever I can. And if you want to use the images that I've shown, please do contact me. And last but not least, oh, I'm on YouTube. Oh, just started that. And this is the cover of my book if you're interested in looking on my website. So oh, wrap it up, WR, wrap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nancy, thank you so much. Thank you uh, for uh, a very uh, engaging presentation. So I think we've got a few questions here. Um, yes. Try and mm -hmm. take that away. All right. We have a question from Jeff. In his present school, they're running Empower with small groups of children who are in the tier three system, but he'd like a recommendation for a program that would that he could use in the, in the classroom. Um, I. I don't want to recommend one program over another on air. There are some good programs uh, mm -hmm. out there. Um, we don't have a lot of Canadian materials, uh, but he can email me. This is something that Onvita does. This is something that Decoding Dyslexia does. I can be emailed privately. This is something that I do supporting schools in choosing a program. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really important that a school looks at their own circumstances when choosing a program. And the biggest thing is that they provide professional development. Uh, too many box programs are sitting on shelves or being used in ways not supported by the research. So I want to say to Jeff, Bring in um, professional development for your teachers and get your teachers on board with choosing the programs. Some of the best things happening in the States, I and mean, it gives me shivers. They brought in uh, professional development. Teachers were a part of the process and they looked at a few programs and chose the program that they wanted. We want teachers to feel a part of this. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to let you know that we have a participant, Ainsley, who is training teachers in New Brunswick, and she's on the wave of change. She wants to let us know. I do have other questions related to programs you would recommend, so I would encourage those people to email you directly. All right, yep. especially, yeah, Canadian programs are in demand, but we don't, we're not familiar with any of them. The, yeah, um, teacher knowledge is more important than any yeah. program. Yes, although, yeah, there are many. We're in Gillingham practitioners, of course, in Canada. But uh, thank you very much. Uh, one last question, and maybe Jill can answer. Just wondering if we're able to show this broadcast to other teachers. Is that possible? 
Well, certainly this has been recorded mm -hmm. and we will yep. be uh, posting it on the website. I so do see another question just came in. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yes. There's a few more coming in. Oh, now. my gosh. I didn't yes. scroll down. Okay. <laughs> Here we are. Okay. Just starting to come in. Yeah. Two questions. How do you address literacy in middle school where students are expected to read to learn, but have not been able to accomplish learning to read? As well, what are your thoughts regarding the use of audiobooks? Um, in middle school, I want to say that it's never too late. We, and this relates to audiobooks, we need to provide, uh, provide our students with the remediation they need, no matter what grade they are in. We can never, never give up on that. And it's our responsibility and leaders, your responsibility to make sure that happens. Mm -hmm. Assistive technology, whether it's audiobooks or other forms of, of technology, they are very valuable. We want to bring them in appropriately. This is why you need somebody supporting you who knows the science, because in some cases they are being used to replace remediation. In some cases they are just being used inappropriately. So they're very advantageous in the right situation. Okay. And we have another question regarding spelling. What is your view on spelling as a morphophonemic spelling system rather than an alphabetic one? How can primary teachers teach the logic of our spelling system if they are teaching that letters make sounds? Hmm. Um, I'm just going to say that, that the uh, structured literacy approach promotes um, teaching phonics and teaching systematically, and that morphology is brought in as part of their process, that wow. process. We are teaching uh, morphological awareness at every stage. I wish parents would be doing this with young children before they go to school. We are, if the more, and I want to say actually that we need to bring parents in to be part of the team. I use, I'm so close to all my parents and, and as a parent myself, I passionately believe that we need to bring parents in as part of the team. And when children struggle, they, they, the parents need to be on board and we're not bringing parents. So if parents know better, then parents can know how better to support the components of structural literacy at home, how to practice at home, but all the components of structural literacy are important. Different ones receive different emphasis at different time, but we, again, um, if, you, if you know um, the different components, you know how to weave it in. There's no way I just do one thing. It's kind of oozing out of me all the time as I teach. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> thank you very okay. much. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for those, uh, answering those questions. Yes.